Bienvenida. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Sandra Reyes from LACNIC staff. Thank you for joining us with this webinar. This is a first webinar this year, which is co-organized with our friends from VENOC, which is a network operators network in Venezuela, and who will be participating as instructions instructors. Alejandro Acosta is the R&D coordinator at LACNIC, and the other instructor is Robinson Rivas, professor at the Central University of Venezuela and a member of VENOC. So before welcoming them, let me tell you some details about this session so that you can make the most of it. And also for those who are joining a LACNIC webinar for the first time, this webinar will be held in Spanish. And this in line with the video that you have in Spanish, let me tell you that we have simultaneous interpretation into the three official languages of LACNIC, Spanish, English, and Portuguese. You'll be able to access these services at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You can also access the subtitles. This webinar will last about two hours. You may feel free to ask any questions. Alejandro will tell you about how the interaction will be taking place, but Please write your questions in the Q&A box so that Alejandro and Robinson can answer them in due time. And finally, let me remind you this webinar will be recorded and after that we'll be sharing the link and it will be also published in LACNIC's website in the training session uh, section. So thank you very much for your attention and we now welcome Alejandro and Robinson. You have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. So thank you very much, Sandra, for your introduction. So thank you very much for those who have joined us today. Today with LACNIC's support, we'll be having this webinar with the support intense support of other organizations with people who have worked with us in the past today, we'll be speaking about IPv6 basics. IPv6, this is not new, and it has been around for quite some time now. Nevertheless, we realize that the implementation of IPv6 and the technical details are uh, not very well known and, the, known, and the implementation of IPv6 has been less widespread than expected, at least in Venezuela, this has been the case. That is why we have organized this webinar for the Latin American region. It's not only for Venezuela. And part of the motivation is that we wish to share this knowledge in order to enhance the implementation of IPv6 in our countries. So now let me introduce Alejandro. Alejandro Acosta is in LinkedIn uh, profile. He has a vast experience in internet working. Uh, in addition to that, he has a degree in engineering from the University of Venezuela, a master's degree in technology management. So he has, as I said, a master's degree in technology management. He's a professor at the university. He has great communication skills and makes complex topics very accessible to all. So he has 
a great skill as an instructor. Now, the interesting thing is that we now wish to hear more about the implementation of IPv6. He has been involved in many activities of LACNIC. He has been uh, R&D manager at LACNIC for 11 years and is coordinator of VNOG. LACNIC is the organization in charge of addressing. So, as I said, he is the coordinator of resume of uh, organizing the new activities of VNOG. The idea is now to have a group of network operators interested in sharing their knowledge, sharing their expertise with the rest of the community so that this can be applied both in the public and the private fields. Alejandro, Juan, how are you? Good morning. Thank you, Robinson. Thank you, Sandra. And this is a great question, Robinson. And I will try to reply it. Unfortunately, I don't have a great or very specific answer for you. I hope that I can maybe provide an answer with this presentation. And I will let you know maybe parts of I will attempt to somewhat put together an answer to your question. Now we have a we will have a, a, a section for Q and A. We have a Q and A button that you can submit your question or the chat, and we can try to. I, I don't know if this will actually happen, but we could try to give one of some of the participants or the attendees the floor and try to address all of the questions that might come up. Now, if there are any questions to which I have no answer right now, I will make a big effort. I will make the, the, the best to try to find an expert to provide you with a, an answer, maybe through an email, or even if I need to call you, I will call you. Okay, so let me begin by sharing I have several presentations, actually. It's not just one. I, let me begin with the introduction. IPv6 introduction. So you can see my presentation, correct, Robinson? Yes, I can. 
Okay, as the course description says, we are going to speak about IPv6 basics today. We're going to discuss the heart, the core of IPv6, something that any engineer who would like to work on IPv6, who would like to deploy IPv6, need to know. Maybe people might have deployed IPv6, but don't know these basics, and they probably have come across certain difficulties. So I want everyone to know how it works, how it operates, how uh, IPv6 works. We'll start from scratch. I hope that after today, you will have no pending uh, questions to be answered. To understand the present, we need to understand the past. So let me go back to some technical basic aspects on IPv6. I will go over this very quickly. So we have TCP IP. This is something that we all we all know, the internet. It's been around for many years. And here we have 1969 marked as the beginning when actually in some biographies, we could say that we could go even further back in time. Now, let's just suppose that in 19, well, let's just say that in 1969, we had ARPANET, the first network using data in the US. In 1981, there was a very important milestone. And I always think that this is what marked the internet that we have nowadays. In 1981, the people at ARPANET, in 83, I'm sorry, the people at ARPANET said, you know what, we're going to adopt the TCP IP protocol as our network protocol. That was a very, very important moment. There were, at the time, other networks, other protocols like IPX, XP, Google Internet, and others. Now, ARPANET, they were very knowledgeable of all. And they said, well, which one are we going to choose for our network? And they chose TCP IP. I skipped 1981. Now, 1981 is when the definition of the IP before protocol was launched. If we go to the IT uh, F, um, page, RFC 791, is what we will find and we'll see how the IPv4 datagram is defined, which you'll see it's basically the same that we use now. How many years after? 42 years after for people like Robinson and I, we've been witnesses of these of this evolution. Now with regards to the depletion and 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 this is connected to what Robinson's uh, question, why should we move from an IPv4 to an IPv6 address? Basically, IPv4 depletion is now a reality. In 1990, is many years ago, is when the first studies about address depletion came out. Remember that in 1990, we started seeing an increase in the general network uh, growth, more internet service providers, and later in the, by the end of the 1990s, we've witnessed the boom of the dot-com, the dot-com era, and progressively we've moved into the internet. So now people needed an IP address. Now, they said the IP addresses that we have will end. It's 4.3 billion, and we have a larger population around the world. People use more than one IP address per person, and that will be depleted. They will come to an end at some point. And this study started in the 1990s already. As of 1993, the internet starts being around. We had the first internet service provider, a private provider coming out, and of course the dot-com boom. We have different IP addresses, so it was very easy for these resources to be depleted. Something about depletion. In IPv4 environment, the IPv4 world, two at 32, remember that each IPv4 address has 32 bits, so mathematically I will have a result of almost 4.3 billion IP addresses around 
as you can see here. People around the world, the world population is at over 7 billion already. So of course we use more than one IP address. We have a laptop, computer, desktop, tablet, smartphones, smart cars, etc. So everything will need to be online, to be connected to the internet. Many years ago, the uh, address policy distribution worked uh, somewhat like that. We had classes, I probably we've all heard about it, class A, B, C, D, E, etc. Now, what was delivered in general belonged to class, class A, B, and C. Now, what happened with the class A? Now, if we remember the mask, which has an A class, point uh, zero, zero, zero. Now, that means that I will have host addresses. All of those bits will be in zero, 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 zero. Class A, it's about, uh, entails about 18 million IP addresses that are held by the companies that you see here. Now, before RIRs came along, IP addresses were assigned by Tom Postel. May he rest in peace. He does sign it, and it was at his own discretion. Of course, he had great criteria, but considering the technology at the time, it was somewhat not accurate. Let's suppose that IPM, and just to name one, I'm not pointing at any company in particular, they needed 5 million IP addresses. It was impossible to deliver class B or C. So they were assigned class A, let's say 18 million IP addresses. Now, if IBM only needed five, we would have about a 13 million IP address loss. And that's what happened across other companies as well. Now, class B and class C could maybe have similar situations. 255 in uh, class B, if I needed to assign 30, I would. I needed a smaller network, I would assign a class C. The map that we see here might look very complex, but basically if we look at it in detail, we can see that this is how addresses were allocated. And this is somewhat current map of the blocks starting zero to 255 as to how they were assigned. IBM, HP, DEC, MIT, General Electric, the US uh, Defense Department, LACNIC, of course, Arin, RIPE, etc. Now, I wanted to mention some of the solutions before we go into the technical details to understand what has happened and why it's lasted so long. He, uh, Robinson mentioned traveling to Japan so many years ago and universities and organizations already speaking about uh, IPv6 addressing and 20 years after that, we are still discussing, well, that's coming, that's coming, that's coming, up until when it's already here. In this journey, I mentioned that in the 1990s, people were already studying depletion. So people said, well, what can we do in the meantime? In 1992, in the IETF uh, framework, the Internet Task Force, it's an organization that created the IP environment standards. At the time, they put together the road group routing and addressing. And among the things that they did that were very significant, a concept that we know very well is the CIDR concept, RFC 4632, uh, which is classless interdomain routing. That's why that's what it stands for. So those concepts and notions of class that we have at some point in our lives, university school discussed, there were, they disappeared. And that's why we are now able to have masks. Mask that is 2455.028 or 0.224, etc. This uh, was possible thanks to the class line interdomain routing. We had length 
and a prefix. Now, this CIDR numbering is used in the IPv6 world. When we mention, when we hear people mentioning masks in the IPv6 environment, it's probably someone that is not very knowledgeable, but well, we can still talk to that person for a little longer. Now, what else happened at the time? DHCP, as we know, this is a concept that, well, I'm sure we are all familiar, is dynamic hub configuration protocol. Now, what does it do? Let's, let's imagine, well, Professor Robinson teaching in Venezuela. Now he is not teaching 24 seven. His classroom will not be full of students 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So when students arrive in the classroom and turn their devices on, whatever network I'm connecting to, the HCP will deliver IP addresses and resources. That also made it possible not to deplete resources or use up resources all the time. What other solutions do we have? And, and this is probably the, the, the most efficient is the NAT concept with the RFC 1918, which refers to private IP addresses. This is why private 10000-8172.16012 and 16800/16. Every time that we are at home, if we have a Wi-Fi router or regardless of the brand, the IP address that we obtain will be a private IP address that belongs to these RFC. And the concept of NAT, the notion of NAT, we will discuss NAT more specifically, but what does it do? It converts, it translates, this is network address translation. It translates the origin address from these public to private to request to surf online to have the response that we need so what we do here you have at home or at your office you receive an ip rfc 1918 and that will translate that private ip to a public ip of course this is good and bad the concept of NAT is good and bad at the same time. Now, I, I have a, a, a presentation that I will show later on about NAT in particular. Any comments, Robinson? Not in the chat, but I have here another one. We have the NAT converts private to public I addresses. I thought that there were only public. So how come now we are saying that we have private addresses as well? Okay, so private IP addresses has a very nice story and why the blocks 10000172160029101 has a very interesting history. And this is associated to the internet framework. Let's begin with network number 10. Well, first people at the time said, well, I like the TCP IP protocol. I want to put my network on TCP IP, but I have a network that I will not connect to the internet. So they say, well, okay, if you're not connecting to the internet, they started speaking about the private addressing notions and concept. Actually, one of the colleagues of Lagnik, RIRs, Daniel Karenberg, um, was a very active participant. Now, having said this, and this is just an anecdote as to why we use the 10 0 networks. 1 0 network is used, and each private block that I am mentioning belongs to one of the former classes that we mentioned before that existed at the same time. 10 0 belongs to class A. So why did we use this one? Because at the time that 
the concept of a private IP addressing concept was developed sort of coincided with the shutdown of the ARPANET network. So when the ARPANET network was coming down, they were assigned the 10.000. So this one was no longer being used. So they said, let's use it. Let's use it as a private network. And 172.16.00 slash 12 class B. Now, why do we have that prefix 172? Because this was the first class B network available subsequently after the creation of the concept of private IPs. And this is what happened with class C as well, 192168, when private IP addresses were created, the first one free in the class C block was this one. Now, in theory, what does this mean? It means that these IP addresses cannot reach the internet. I'm connected at home uh, with my router at home and it assigned an IP address. If I try to get online and serve the net, internet service providers will drop that prefix. Why? Because this IP is private. And, and, and just let me end this by saying, let, let me just very quickly say this. Many people use these IP. Alejandro, for our interpreters, when you say drop, they will drop, they will do without. Thank you. So let me, well, speaking about private and public IPs, people will eventually use the concept of valid or invalid IP. I don't really like that concept in, when people jargon, people speak about a valid IP, they speak about public IP. We have an IP that can get online, can serve the net, you can use Google, Yahoo, Facebook, get some answers and basically do what we want. And an invalid IP is what people speak about, an invalid IP that you will not be able to serve. Now, a private IP, is a, an IP perfectly written and it's not necessarily invalid. I, so I don't like to use those terms. I don't like to use the jargon. IPv6 in the IPv6 uh, concept, public does not exist. So remember that we are going to use global IPv6. If you speak about a public IPv6, we are not necessarily using the correct terms used in IPvF, but could, this is what people refer to when we speak about public IPv6. So I would rather use, or if we want to be more accurate, we should use the global IPv6 term. Now let's speak about, and I think an interesting topic could be headers. Any questions that you might have, let me know. So we said that this was a technical concept. So we need to look at the format and what is transferred, what's transmitted. Let's look about the IPv6 header. Now, when we speak about IPv6 headers, it is always good to say or to review what happened in the past. So IPv4 header, what is the IPv4 header? Let's go back to IPv4. In IPv4, let 
Let me see if I can highlight this. B31. And basically, what happens here? B0 to 31, I have 32 bits. Now, what happens to the header, the IPv4 header? In the first field, each box that we see here, these are our fields. IPv4 will have 12. And I will have one that is an optional. And it's not only optional, but since it's optional, it might change the size of the header. So let's remember this. The size of the IPv4 header might change. So let's go field by field. The version. The version, of course, in IPv4 will be given, will have a four number, binary number. I also have the header size or the I, the internet header length, the size of the header, which is basically the size that we will have across the entire header. I need this because I might or not have options. This might change from 20 bytes up to here. 20 bytes, and most times online, I will have a 20 byte header. Now, TOS, the type of service, It's what we now call DSSP, which is the differentiated service call point, which is the quality of service. I will have audio, video networks. I will mark this as I need a number and the network will use it with more or less delay or they will do what they need to do. A total size, So there's only one when we are speaking about IPv6, why? In IPv6, this is the total size of the data. Now I have another field, which is the identification ID, which I'm sure you've seen. We are going to assign an ID. This is important. We have the fragmentation concept, a concept that has uh, a different uh, meaning in IPv6, which don't fragment to the middle. Now in these flags, I have three bits. We have a bit that is reserved and I have two more, MF, which is more fragments, and another one that is DF, that is do not fragment. If we want, if you want me to go deeper in these topics, let me know. I like the, the, the term pointer. And let me just uh, uh, discuss this a little bit further. What happens in the IPv4 world? If I inject a packet to the network, it will come out, but when it leaves my network, it will have a given size. Traditionally, the size will given by, well, the, the need to send it, but it's defined by the MTU. What does that mean? Let me see if I can write it down here at the bottom. MTU is the maximum transmission unit maximum transmission unit. If I want to, for example, Robinson, I can tell you I have a virtual machine, it's a four giga machine, and you say, okay, send it to me. 
of course, I cannot just include these four gigas in one packet and line and send it to Robinson. So what will my computer do? Right in the middle or the Wi-Fi network in this case, it told my computer, you know what? My MTU is 1500 bytes, which is the most common option. If you have this, you will take your four gigabytes of the virtual machine that I want to send to Robinson and it will fragment it into uh, smaller units of up to 1500. Now fragmentation occurs when I have a supplier between Robinson and myself that says I will not accept 1500 by packets, but 1400 by packets. And I will have to divide this packet in two. And in a minute, you will understand why I'm explaining fragmentation. So just remember everything that will happen in the router. The router will have to copy the ID for each packet. They will have to handle flags to indicate in the first packets and the last packets, the bit MF in one. And additionally, the fragment offset has to state a pointer. Why? because if it's going from my network to Robinson's network, they will have to put that packet in back in order and they will use the beats on and off plus the fragmentation. So we will rebuild the package as it left my computer. This is a very important flag. Now, this is another time to list. Um, field in IPv4, this concept in IPv6, another concept which is an off limit, what TTL does, well, time in this case is not uh, an accurate term, but basically the TTL, what it does is that every time the packet goes to a layer three device, the layer that goes through the package, it will reduce this TTL to one. When it reaches zero, it means that the lifetime of this package has expired. If we've done a pin, a three route, this is what we've done for all of us who are more familiar with networks. This mechanism is used as a technique to discover the jumps the uh, packet goes through. Now the protocol basically will indicate the recipient of the IPv4 package, what I'm carrying. This is a layer three, remember, as we know it. The protocol says that I am taking TCP, AP, and routing protocol, a tunnel. So I will indicate it with this protocol field. Now I have another field that is the checksum which is a mechanism to know whether the package, or well, if it has suffered any damage in this journey. I will use an algorithm, a checksum algorithm with the existing fields. I will have a 16-bit field, a series of numbers, 0001. Once the other party receives it, they will use the same algorithm and they will identify whether the package was damaged or not. So I have a source address, destination address, so the two bit and potentially options. This is what an IPv4 header looks like, basically. Any questions with regards to the IPv4 header before we move on to the IPv6? It was somewhat of a very brief explanation, but I hope I hope it was clear. Okay. So let's now speak about IPv6 header. The IPv6 header, and, and and you will see another another slide next, which the, the, the font is, is better. But what has changed? And, and some of you will uh, 
maybe disagree with this. Well, some of these things were removed. Actually, when you go to an IPv6 class, you will see that we can describe it faster than four. The size of the header was eliminated because we always have 40 bytes in IPv6. It's always fixed. ID was removed, flags were removed, the fragment offset was eliminated, checksum and options, all of these, which you see in red, do not exist anymore. So it is easier for a router, easier, more simple, quicker, because I have fewer fields. Now, why were these fields eliminated? Well, basically because fragmentation does not exist anymore. ID, flags, the pointer, I don't need it anymore. That mechanism I told you about that I am sending something to Mr. Robinson and a package would leave my computer, a 1500 byte package and somewhere in the middle says my MTU is 1400 byte and that router would fragment that package. Well, that will no longer happen. There are mechanisms, PMTUD, and I will write it down here at the bottom. I will come back to these. PMTUD, this is the algorithm used. It's not a protocol. This is cover is used. I, I, I know what is the MTU maximum needed to reach Robinson. So if I know that it's 1390 bytes, all of the package from me to him will have that size, 1390 bytes. Fragmentation is no longer needed. If you are interested in environmentally friendly aspects and so on, nowadays, if you take a router and you inject 5, 10, 1 giga, or traffic giga, in IPv6, they will use up uh, less CPU that IPv4. Now, checksum was eliminated. It was a very interesting field, and you might wonder why is such an important field? Why was such, such an important field eliminated? How? Now, the checksum, uh, uh, let me go back a little bit. Let me go back. Checksum was eliminated from IPv6. Why? Because many tests were run, of course. A layer two field, all protocols will have their own checksum. For example, if we compare the internet, which is the one that we use the most, Internet, Ethernet will have the CRC, the cyclical check uh, cycle, checksum. It will, it's very similar. CRC will function as a checksum, and I will know whether layer two or layer four, TCP, UDP, and all protocols at the same time have their own checksum. So they said, why use? these uh, mathematics, making the network slower. I will need to use several words. The, the jargon, this is the jargon used, several words from the, my header to calculate the checksum, which is a complement. And this is a very heavy action. A package is calculated easily, but networks nowadays manage several uh, gigabytes worth of traffic. So it really, this is not necessary in the IPv6 world and options were also eliminated. Now, what else happened in the IPv6 header? Four fields changed names. I had the type of service, now it's a uh, traffic class. Now the quality of service I had here, it has equivalent here. It's basically the same. Total length, well, I don't need both sizes field. Total length is now payload length. I don't need this header size and the total length size. Why? Because I already know that my header size is 40 bytes. 
Now, having said that, I know that the data that will come right here, this is what I want to show. I already know the size of my header. This is always 40 bytes. I just need to know my data. Protocol is now called next header. So the f basically the idea is, is to make the field more realistic, to be more associated and closely linked to what it actually does. Now, TTL is now called hub limit. Hub limit is very descriptive, right? It's very much self-explanatory. Now, TTL uh, five, that meant that I could have three uh, layer three devices. Now, it just makes better sense now. Now, the role of the function is exactly the same. If you, if you know how TTL worked, you'll know how hub limit works. If you know how protocol worked, you know how next header works now. What else? Now, oh, sorry. Flow label, now it's uh, larger. It did not exist before. I can have different types of service quality, voice or video. Flow label can also use for clients. For example, how well will handle clients for source outing. Everything that is marked with whatever flow, I will route it through a certain channel or trajectory in my network. Version, and now version, IPv4 and 6, these fields remain the same. I have the source address. It's now 128 bits. And as Robinson said earlier, an IPv4, now an IPv6 address, is larger. Where is it written? Right here. And this is what the header looks like. I know I have like 10 seconds left for this topic, just in case you have a question, any comments. We actually do have a couple of questions waiting for you. Privacy. One of the questions about privacy of the IPv6 addresses. Can I hide my IPv6 address? No. If I use a public NAT, maybe different ones could be used. This is one of the questions for you. And then about ping, security pings. I mean, both questions are related to security and filters. With regards to privacy, well, in IPv6, security is more widely considered than IPv4. We actually have the concept of IPv6 address uh, security concept, and this is very interesting. And we could go really back in time and describe uh, this so we are all on the same page. In IPv6, the world of IPv6 is so vast, the number of IPv6 addresses that we could have. And I have said this number so many, many times in my life, and I can never remember the exact figure, because you can compare this to the number of uh, stars that there are in the universe or grains of salt in the universe. I mean, this is such a crazy number of IPv6 addresses, but how does security work and, and so on? Nowadays, I have my computer, I have IPv6, now, what would my computer do? And this is the beauty of privacy. If I'm surfing online, I 
go to a certain website and get the IP addresses. Since this is not traditionally assigned, but it's the computer or the host itself that will generate it. Every two hours, my computer will generate a new IP address. And so my IP address will change as I surf the net. So it is even harder for someone to track me or to find my location. There are many ideas, and these standards are long-standing standards. I would say at, at least eight, nine, ten years. At the beginning, with the IPv6 world, all IPv6 addresses were formed by hosts based on EUE64 algorithm. Under this algorithm, the IP address that a host would use was somewhat of 64 bits of the prefix online and 64 of EUE64. Now, this was based on what? And, and this is the, the, the what well, we're going to see the attack on privacy. When it was based, on the MAC address, MAC addresses are always fixed. We have 48 bits from the network guard written explicitly by the vendor and assigned by the AAA. Now, what would happen if I served the line, the, the, the net, the last 64 bits were always going to be the same. If I now visit this university website, I could easily be tracked because the last 64 were going to be the same. So they could see that I went to the university, to LACNIC office, to my house. I, I was uh, being tracked or it was very easy to track me all the time. Now, if we were going to create the algorithms for IP privacy algorithms, so every two hours, the host will generate a new IP address, so whenever I'm online or offline, depending on the operating system, it will create a new uh, system. I could maintain my old IP addresses for a 24 hour range based on different aspects. People are always concerned about security, of course, because they're going to say, well, this is a global uh, aspect. So this is a risk. But, of course, we are going to have firewalls, a firewall wall box. The boxes that we have at home are going to be stayed full, and they will enable outgoing connections, so you will not be able to reach them. And another thing to mention is that different possibilities, the possibilities for you to have an IP address and someone to track it are very small. Uh, that is very unlikely that it uh, will happen. Now, having said that, if I have a, a global IPv6 address, we have nothing to worry about. There was a security test that someone did. They used an Ubuntu with a very easy password with a public IPv4 address, and they did the same with the global IPv6. Well, they were not able to reach the IPv6 address. As of March 2023, we have nothing to worry about. I saw that there was a question about ECMMP, right? ICMP? Yes. For 890, correct? Yes. But maybe we can address it in a couple of minutes when we are speaking about the global concept of security. Yes, they are also speaking about the protocols of security protocols. And of course, this goes hand in hand with the aspects that we will discuss later on. Yeah, it's almost 11. So let me skip this presentation. Let me go from this presentation to the neuro discovery, which I, I think it's very important to discuss the header. And I have a security presentation where I speak about different filtering, routing, switching aspects. So Robinson, please, we can we can we can do that. Let's just leave this sort of pending and, and, and we will come back to this. And don't worry, we will answer 
all questions. Este, ya voy a parar aquí. Okay. Este, bueno, voy a hablar, voy a responder la de Emorillo porque tiene que so, ver con respecto al tema de seguridad y privacidad. Now, regarding security and privacy, that is quite clear. Now, for those networks who have fixed IPv6 for P2P, BGP, loot pack, loop packs, and all the rest. Your question is a good question. And much in the same way as the IPv6 addresses are dynamically generated, I can also have fixed uh, IP addresses in a server, in a printer, whatever. So in that case, you will always have to have firewalls and all the relevant things. And this is like with the public IP addresses, the BGP sessions, you have many different ways of ensuring your BGP sessions. We practice the most basic ones, for example, MD5 and other options. So now let's we let's go over to the next presentation. And this is the other part, which is a core of IPv6. Which is neighbor discovery. This doesn't contain very much text, and I always stop to explain what I have on the slide. So neighbor discovery, some people call this NDP, for example. So whenever you see ND, this means neighbor discovery. So in Spanish, they call it descubrimiento de vecinos, but it's neighbor discovery. So I prefer NMDP, it's Neighbor Discovery Protocol. I like to call it NDP. But this all means the same thing. And if we understand the concept of header, and if you understood it in IPv6, well, that's good. Otherwise, I could go on to this part. And thanks to your question, I normally try to base myself on the questions that I are, that are asked. So what we heard about filtering and DCMP and so on, these things can be referred to when we explain neighbor discovery. So when we speak about NDP, what does this mean? Neighbor discovery is una suite. basically is a message suite. So these are several messages. So much as you have the IPv4 world and we speak about ARP, well, let's make it more dynamic. What do you think ARP is used for? What do you think? Can anyone help me? You can write it in the chat. Yes, good answer. Associating an IP address to a host. To obtain MAC data in an IP address. Okay. I am happy to see Ariel here. Good. So, this has this is what ARP does. Someone else says uh, IP address link. Uh, table, sorry, linked to Mac. So ARP, let's write it down here. 
This means address resolution protocol. And like Ariel stated, it means to determine or find out a MAC address based on IP address. So you assume you're at home and you have your Wi-Fi and you want to reach the router in the network, the router and the border of the network. So let's see. I'm going to put it over here. This is very simple. So can you see my terminal? Yes. So this will be very simple. Basically, if I have a network, my computer has this, I, if config in zero, this is my IP address, 192.168.2223. And when you ping the first thing, it will, you'll see is my computer. So this is the MAC address of my computer. So through a local network, the packets are delivered in addition to the IP address to the destination MAC address. So my computer now will have a command which is called who has. It will send a packet and it's going to ask who has 192.168.21. So this is what we call a broadcast command to my network and then we receive an, a reply. So who is going to answer? The one that has this address 192.168.21. It's going to say, well, this is me and that is the MAC address. Then later on at layer two level, the communication is done, obviously, to the destination MAC of that computer. ARP minus AN is the reply obtained, which is the MAC table of my device. So this is a more private network I have at home. It's telling me that the network 192.168.21 has this MAC address. Now, why did I stop here? Because I'm interested to explain that the NDP protocol, the NDP protocol, the neighbor discovery protocol, replaces ARP. ARP as such does not exist in the IPv6 world, among other reasons, because it uses broadcast and in IPv6, we don't have broadcast. And IPv6 has an algorithm implemented for this purpose. So. I'm going to explain this later on. So what we use is neighbor solicitation. I'm going to explain that later on, NS. I have some examples here. So, so this is a suite of commands. It allows me to do the... In IP4, we had concepts such as router discovery and ICMP. Now, in the ICMP world, we have ICMP v6, and even more ICMP in the IPv6 world is more organized than in the IPv4 world, ICMP. I'm not sure if this will be in the other presentation, but in the ICMP header, if we stop and take a look at it, if we stop and check what ICMP has, it has three fields, a type, a code, a checksum, and a payload. It has four fields. That is all it has. The type and the code in ICMP version 4 are quite disorganized in terms of the assignment, according to what Ayana did originally. But then we said, let's organize things better. So when reporting is produced, the numbering is this or the other. So. In the past, neighbor discovery did not exist in the IP for all. So we can see how the network can be optimized. The configuration is wonderful. It works like a charm. And in most of the IPv6 worlds, I won't need a, a server, a JCP server. 
hacer cosas complicadas, no sé, mira, no quiero que ese sea el gateway, sino que so, ese tipo de cosas. I will not need to do complicated things. So most of the networks will not need that. So it detects addresses and many more things. Now, let us have a look at the packet of suites. There are five suites of packets. In March 2023, in, in NDP, these are those who have. All these are ICMP version six packets. So when we're speaking about what we can filter and what we cannot filter, and this is has to do with the questions that were asked later on, much of the things that I'm going to mention now, at least at the level of local network, are things that should not be filtered. I should not filter these because otherwise I can break the network. So which are the packets that have ICMPv6? You have router solicitation. Here we have the type. We have router advertisement, we have neighbor solicitation, we have neighbor advertisement and redirect. Adelante, Robinson. Yes, Robinson, go ahead. I wanted to mention that someone was asking a question in this context and you're answering it. I will now have to uh, leave for a few minutes, but I will take a look at the questions when I return. Thank you, Willie, and thank you all for your questions. Hi, Willie. So let us take a look at your question. We lost your question. So someone deleted it. There were two questions from Willy. So Willy had asked, can you speak about RFC 6490? And he was now asking a question of something that's more specific about one of the RFCs. I know which you are referring to. I don't know exactly each part of the detail, but what is this RFC about 4890? This is a very important document. It speaks about the recommendations of what I should and what I should not filter in my IPv6 networks. This is very important. Another good news, Willie, is that this is not the only document in that, on that topic, it is a very important vendor. Maybe that vendor lost some of the Latin American market, but it's a very famous vendor. Now, they have very good documents on what to filter and what not. And this not only is about the good documents, but they also have examples. For example, what should be enabled or not, you have the access list and all the rest. You mentioned ICMP with hop limit equal one. I never saw that. I don't know if RFC 4890 mentions this. I don't know why that should be blocked at all. Maybe behind that there might be a justification. So if anyone has the answer, that would be great. Now, because even if we're in a re the hop limit reaches a device, which is different from TTL, if it's one, when I have to mark zero, the device that has to do this, that has to apply this function, will have the responsibility of submitting a packet or sending a packet back to the IP, the origin IP. I have to send a packet back to origin, which is called time exceeded on transit. Now, why this should be blocked? Well, I wouldn't know. And if you were to ask me, 
well, it does all the tracing. Willie, really, we might see that later on. But you, 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 that's a good question. I'm going to answer the other way around. This is something that happens in NDP. This is the core of IPv6. We have to understand this. Now, let's look at the, the other way around. An NDP packet has to always have the hop limit of 255. It's an 8-bit field, and all the bits have to be on because these are things that I do within my network. I don't do NDP from a VLAN to another VLAN or from a network to someone else's network in another country. So this contains these NDP packets that we mentioned. It contains the source link layer address, the target link layer address, prefix information, redirected header, MTU. And the prefix information is very, very important. Thanks to this information here, you can do self-configuration. And I have some examples here. We have five packets in IPv4. Now let us have a look at the basic one. Basically, this is the one that replaces the concept of RP that we mentioned. So we are all in an IPv6 network, and I need to connect to the computer next to me. This could be the router, it could be the printer, or whatever. I know the IP address of this device. It doesn't matter how I know the IP address, but I had it statically in my host table, or I obtained it through DNS. It doesn't matter. But I know the IP address of this other device. So what I need to do is to communicate with that device. So as a host, what am I going to do? The first thing is I'm going to send a packet called NS. It is called neighbor solicitation. In ERP, we send a who has. This no longer exists. That was in IPv4. So I send a neighbor solicitation in IPv6. It's my origin, my destination address, which is a multicast one. So in that way, we immensely improve the network. So host A deposits the packet in the network, and basically, it reaches those who have to be reached. In the sketch, we just have the B. But if it's multicast, in this case, it only reaches this one on the screen. So let us read the description. What does a neighbor solicitation do? This is one of the commands, one of the NDP components. It determines the link layer addressing of neighbors on the same link. It replaces the RP protocol. It uses multicast address and solicited node. So this is what we call multicast solicited node address. So this makes things a bit more complex, but it's just 40 seconds more. I'm going to use the last 24 bits of this address, and I'm going to link these to 104 fixed bits. And this creates the solicited node. It's a special multicast address. And this is wonderful because only very few hosts are found in this multicast group. When I deposit the packet, only few computers will receive this. In the past, in ERP, there was like a flooding of the network when we tried to find out the MAC address of someone else. So only very limited number of computers will receive this, maybe just one. And afterwards, we get the NDS, the neighbor solicitation, and the NDP works as follows. And what occurs with the reply? This is a beauty too. It will receive by B, basically. It's going to say, well, this IP address which you're searching the MAC for, I have that. I'm going to answer with a neighbor advertisement. So the answer to a neighbor solicitation is a neighbor advertisement. And it sends a packet to A informing the link layer address of B. 
So if you ask yourself, how is this informed technically? Well, these are very cool tests, which you can do in a virtualizer, or if we have an IPv6 network, just test out how this works. So this information here is like a payload, an ICMP payload in v6. So I'm going to send a v6 packet, which is a type 136, and the payload of this packet is the MAC address that it has, that B has. And based on that, address A starts building its table. You have the RP table, and you also have the neighbor discovery table. And it knows that our PV6 address has this MAC address when they communicate at layer two level, at this level, and also at layer three. And they can communicate perfectly. And this is quite cool at layer two, so he corrects himself. Let's speak about layer three. Now, the neighbor solicitation is with multicast, but the answer is unicast. So the network is quite optimized. Let us have a look at a So this one, this is what I wanted to explain. These are the most important packets that have to do with the core of IPv6. And this is very important. Think about this network. I have a router here and I have two PCs. I have mentioned Espectacular. that in IPv6, we have the concept of plug and play. I put the cable and my host will generate the IPv6 address. It will identify the gateway, the DNS, and everything will connect almost perfectly. Not to say perfect, because of course, you might come across problems always. Now, there is a router in all the networks, of course. Of course, there might not be one, but most of the networks do have a router. If my router speaks IPv6 and it does it by default, otherwise I have to state that. Now, basically, I have my router here. At least most of the vendors, of course, do so. Now, I have my router. It has IPv6. So what will it do through the interface where its clients are connected? Uh, the university campus or whatever. So it will be sending out all the time, every five minutes or so, the standard has it defined the number. It will be sending out small packets, which are RA packets. And why does it do so? It's to announce that it is a router and that this network exists. And what does the description say? We are speaking here. Here it is. Here we have it. This is NDP, Neighbor Discovery Protocol. And here we have the RA messages. It will send out the RA messages. These RA messages contain options, prefixes, lifetime, and the autoconfig flags. And what happens behind this when the packet is sent out? All the computers will receive the packet. It's almost like a broadcast packet. It's a multicast packet called all nodes. So the packets are sent out and the computers that receive it will analyze what has been written, options, prefixes, lifetime, flags. And it is written in ICMP version six. So having done this, once these computers receive the packet, as, and because they analyze it, they look at the prefix, then they can auto-configure. What does auto-configuration mean? They use, let me do an, analog, an analogy with the network prefix. It's not a very nice one, but it's, it explains the point. Imagine I say, we're all in the network 10, 0, 0, 0. Please configure your IP addresses, whichever you wish. And then Robinson comes and he puts 10.0.0.25, Ariel does 10.0.0.4, and someone else does 31, and so on. But I, that is what the router does. 
with IPv6, it tells them the prefix is 2001.21, etc. And then they come and they do self-configuration and so on. In the IPv6 world, this auto configuration works perfectly well. And some people say, well, if Ariel comes and does a configuration in 10.0.0.25 and Carolina comes and wanted to configure 10.0.0.25, IPv6 has a mechanism to detect those situations of duplicated IPv6. So in auto configuration, that should never occur. So don't worry about that. So once again, to sum up, the routers are going to be sending out RA messages about five minutes, and all the devices in the network will receive this. And there's a joke in the nerd world that says that the routers in the IPv6 world feel so proud that they are routers that they keep on telling one all the time, I am, I exist, and so on. So what else do we have here, which can be important? This is another packet, redirect. We have to understand this packet too. And in the IPv4 world, it works very well. All right, let us assume I like to draw things on the slides. So here we have the city of Valencia, for example, just any name. So it's Valencia. So that's a very a, a great packet. Many of you saw it in the IPv4 world. Some vendors have the redirect enabled by default. And it also occurs in those situations where I have a topology similar to the one that I'm going to explain here. So it might be a bit complex to visualize. But maybe you have already experienced this, I'm sure. So I have computer C over here. And by default, they have router A. So my computer wishes to reach Valencia. Router A Tiene que hacerlo a de router B. Espero que estén knows that to reach Valencia, frío, it has to do this through router B. So if I enable this, if I run it like this, A sends it to B and B sends it to Valencia. And we get the reply, reply from Valencia, it answers to B, and B is not going to send it to A. It doesn't send it to A, but deposit is in the network. It is likely that everything will work decently well. But if we see what is occurring, I'm wasting resources, too much bandwidth over here. I'm wasting, I'm spending processing and memory and CPU in router A to carry out this routing. And in terms of security, I'm creating an asymmetrical routing because this is quite a big route uh, data flow. But if it is a layer four, it sends to router A and then to B and then to Valencia. But if computer C would like to continue transmitting, how are you going to continue transmitting to Valencia? if the answer from Valencia was never received by router A. So a symmetric routing has to be created. Maybe they don't even communicate at TCP level because there will be no data flow here. So what does the redirect packet do, the redirect message do? So basically, it does the following. Router A will be intelligent to see that computer C and router B are in the same network. So it will send a redirect message to computer C and will say, don't send any more messages to me. Send the message directed to router B, which is in the same LAN. And it will then be able to communicate perfectly well. 
so it will modify the routing table in real time thanks to the fact that the redirect message were received and the following packets, the following messages will be sent through router B. There's a question in the Q&A, let's see. Fernando Contreras, and thank you for your question. He's saying that what you have just explained, is this what we call Slack? Yes, exactly. I'm going to write it down over here because your comment is most valuable. Let me write it down here. So what I spoke about auto configuration is what we call Slack. In other words, stateless auto configuration. When it's DHCP, it's stateful. Normally, we use Slack in the IPv6 world. It's stateless auto configuration. Configuración sin estado. ¿Qué es la configuración sin estado? And ¿Qué es la configuración sin estado? Stateless auto configuration is the following: the device receives the RA message. It it does auto configuration. That is what we call stateless. So let's go over to the part on security. So now we have another question. In the case of balancing with several internet providers, what happens with the internal IP addresses for each host? Mauricio, that's a great question. And even today, there's a lot of discussion around this topic at IETF. And I have good and bad news. Let me start with the bad news. Unfortunately, well, of course, it's good that this webinar is being recorded. As much as we have NAT44, this can also be done with NAT66, but it's quite ugly. I never recommend doing that. We're going to see a slide on that afterwards. Now, what happens with balancing? The scenario mentioned by Mauricio is the following. I have a network of different internet providers, provider A, provider B, and IPv6, but my computers have auto configuration and are using prefixes of provider A. If provider A crashes, it's going to go to vendor B. So the same thing happens. Now, what options do we have? Well, there are many options. In fact, we have quite neat uh, solutions, particularly at the level of spricting. This is maybe not very elegant, but they're good because they all work. So if a vendor crashes, I can do rapidly. Configure another one with Slack, another part of the network with Slack, they have a provider, sorry. And some have in, in, in smart options. I can have two routers, for example, with Slack, one with provider A, one with provider B, and who are delivering IPv6 addresses, both of them. So both of them are receiving two networks through Slack, through different IPv6 networks. Now, the hosts have an algorithm that shows the sequence, the rationale that will be followed in the case of having IPv6 addresses, and then which of these will be used. So it's quite normal in IPv6 networks that all the devices have more than one IPv6 addresses. And when we speak about privacy, if I have privacy algorithm and my computer has been running for quite a long time, then we'll see quite a lot of IPs. Now, basically, what are the solutions here, Mauricio? If you recall, 
one of the things that I can send in the RA message is a lifetime. So if one of the providers crashes in the RA, I can say that prefix that I'm sending doesn't last any seconds. So the second provider does work and then they can use the other provider without any issues. So that's the neatest solution. And otherwise it's using NAT. So I hope this answers your question, Mauricio. Hay unas preguntas también en el chat. Este dice ah, la, la, la autoconfig. I see some questions in the chat. Autoconfig is a kind of DHCP. Well, you can explain it like that. It, a DHCP server is that the devices do auto configuration. So that's, it's, yes, kind of. <laughs> so SD1, well, yes, that is also possible. Would this apply to SD1? So thank you for your questions. Uh, Can you hear me, Alejandro? Yeah, I saw the answer kind of, yes. So when you configure and write the address, uh, not having to do this implies not making mistakes. So it's better to have a protocol that assigns the address in a more secure way. So this is what I wanted to add. That's a good comment, thank you. So let us now speak about a different topic. And this has to do with security. So let's speak about the problems we have in the NAT world. Some people might think that, well, I have IPv4, I, I don't. But we do have problems. Whenever we mentioned NAT, like today, and the source IP address, and this can be NATed, there are many ty different types of NATs that have, there are many different names, CGN, LSN, NAT444, 444, and many more concepts. Now, basically, what I'm interested in conveying is what NAT does and what it can be used for. So as we are aware, network allows several devices to share the same public IP address. But many users can share the same IP address, as I said, but the concept I want to leave with you is that this is not a sustainable solution. So let us look at the problems of NAT. Let me focus on these. The internet architecture with NATs are quite complex. They are not scalable. They are prone to failures. Sometimes it, you might not listen to a call and the gamers who are here and so on. Issues with games and so FIFA, on. Et cetera. FIFA or whatever. There are many problems that uh, arise because of NAT, the problems with NAT. And these are some of the problems. Let me read, mention this. When, we, when sharing this same IP4 address, the communication model peer-to-peer -peer is altered. If I sent a packet from my computer to Ariel, that packet goes 
if it goes through NAT, it will be altered because the source IP address will be changed. And of course, everything behind this, particularly in the IPv4 world and the packet that reaches Ariel will not be the same packet as the one as I sent out. And the access list, access control list, many of you have experienced this. If I have networks which with access list and if I modify the access list, I might have collateral effects. I have problems, for example, with a client, with Pedro, and I've tried to fix Pedro, but I might affect Francisco or Maria. So the third one over here, the third point here, is one of the things that is quite important. So when traffic from a bad customer is blocked, traffic from multiple good customers is also blocked. For example, let us imagine a university campus, wherever. For example, the Wi-Fi has 250 students. And if one student starts to try to hack a bank, let us say, and they do scanning and cross-site scripting and SQL injection. So the bank IPs and so on will see that something is happening and will then block that address. So through SQL injection or whatever. So what happens then? And at that university campus, 250 people are sharing the same IP address. So if there's a person who wishes to connect to the bank to pay, for example, the electricity bill or the debt that person has in the uh, cafeteria, so that person will be unable to do so because the bank blocked the entire IP address, the entire IP address with all the people behind it. So one person did uh, something wrong and all the rest were affected. Other things that occur in the NAT world, for example, if I wish to identify who accessed a service through that campus network, I want to know who on January the 20th at 3 p.m. opened the website of LACNIC. So I have to look for the provider at the university and that the university also saved all the NATs done for public and private IP addresses, the port, the destination, the time, and so on. So that also involves cost. It costs money. We're speaking about CPU, about memory, of virtual machines, and many more things. So the point is, having IPv4 is expensive. NAT boxes have limitations related to the number of sessions. They have memory and have CPU. It consumes resources. So if I abuse, then the NAT box will no longer be able to do NATing. And then more complex issues, for example, customers from different countries browse the internet through the same IP address. So I have an IP address in Venezuela, and then it's using Colombia and so on, and vice versa. Someone in Colombia wishes to have a passport or an ID obtained from Venezuela and so on. So these things happen quite a lot. And then we have country-specific web pages for Google, Twitter. They will think we are in a different country, you know, also like with the movies. You make them believe you're in a different place. And then other problems have to do with port forwarding. This will become more difficult. For example, a camera, a camera in a classroom. And I'm going to tell you, well, it's going to be a fixed IPv4 static address. You can listen to it in one port, but then I have to go to the border router. And then the border router has a public IPv4 address and a given port. So it will do port forwarding to the private IPv4 address, etc. Now, if you explain this to your granny, to you other people who or lawyers or doctors ever, it's, it's not so easy. 
And if there are, there are users behind a NAT, they don't control. This is also a problem. There are many problems with uh, games, with consoles and network games. If you have gamers, which you will probably have, and if you wish the gamer to decrease the number of calls, and if you want things to work for them, deploy IPv6. That's my answer. This is a cost. The cost of NAT per user, it's $40 per user. But we start having 100, 5,000, 10,000, et cetera, users think that is, of course, much more expensive. So the conclusion is that NAT is a temporary solution and IPv6 is a long-term solution. Este, aquí, oh, bueno, voy a responder algunas preguntas que están por acá. Eh, señor Willy Cárdenas, ¿es recomendable y práctico usar prefijos? We have some questions over here. Is it recommended practice to use slash 127 and slash 126 prefixes for PGP peering? That's a great question. And let me explain why. We have the VGP peering session which I assume is between two WANs, and you can use slash 127 in that one. And let me explain that in the IPv6 world, there is no softnet nor broadcast. So those networks, the slash 30 that I used in the IPv4 world, where I had two IPs, this is no longer the case in IPv6. Will it, I'm sorry to say that I don't have a, an explicit answer to your question. You can do this with any of the two. It's going to be equally good with slash 127 or slash 126. So there is no answer that I can recommend one from the other. And you can also, if you want to go beyond this and at the level of address planning, many people use a slash 64, the complete slash 64 of a one. They reserve this, they document this, but in practice, the devices will have a slash 106 configured. So I hope that this was a somewhat better answer. Yes, tell me. We have many questions, all are very interesting. You were answering the first one from Willy Cárdenas. Guille Guidetti is asking until how many users as a maximum can you have sharing a public IP address? And let me explain that one of the reasons that have limited the adoption of IPv6 is the cost of changing. I'm sorry, the audio of uh, Robinson's audio is quite poor. I can hardly hear. I'm sorry, the audio is quite choppy. There are many public and private organizations in Latin America. We have devices and agencies that don't have the capacity to continue growing. We don't have the capacity to have a NAT that covers an entire university campus because the devices are quite old and they don't have sufficient memory. So those are the reasons that explain why adoption of IPv6, which might seem more expensive in the long run is cheaper because you can use lesser devices and we will not require to do NATing and DHCP as in the case of having IPv4. So that's one of the reasons that explain the importance of changing over to IPv6. So if you do NAT and you have sufficient memory, you might have 25 million people, sorry, 25,000 people connected. But that If those devices are at the maximum capacity, then this also limits other functions. 
So IPv6 is a clear advantage. And regarding IP4 service providers, Alejandro has much more information on this concept. So maybe you can answer this question, Alejandro. So let me check this once again. Let me have a look at the question. Well, the question is, if we implement IPv6, we don't need NAT. But what if our provider is IPv4? Well, this is quite a typical case, but now less and less typical because providers normally are IPv6 nowadays. And I say, let me complete my sentence. If the providers do not offer IPv6, I think that one of the most important, greatest things could be just changing providers, but maybe this is not so easy. Now, but if you can change providers, that would be so, in base, yes, esa... the best path to follow. Now, based on that concept, a great anecdote came up, and maybe you can look this up. I'm going to include this in the chat. It's a sad story of a... <laughs> I'm going to include this in the chat now. It's in English and in Spanish, and you can find it in Google. Let me include it in the chat just a minute. That's a sad story of an ISP without IPv6. And regarding NAT, if you only have IPv4, you can do tunneling. You can you have to use a tunnel broker. And I normally recommend, recommend I'm going to write it in the chat again. Hurricane Electric is a super tunnel broker. It's very easy to configure. They have an excellent service and it's very easy to configure. So if you just say my border router is a Cisco X and then it tells you which commands you have to enter with your user, with the IP. If I have a red hat, you put the command, you enter the commands and you already know your user and all the rest. So the tunnel broker of Hurricane Electric is great. And regarding NAT, I'm going to say something that's very important. When I don't have an IPv4 network, and I use 10,000 NAT sessions, for example, and I deploy IPv6, so I'm going to decrease the NAT approximately by 50%. So at 10,000 NAT sessions, this will drop to half to 5,000. This is because all the people that did everything in IPv4 will now starting opening Wikipedia in IPv6 and Netflix in IPv6 and YouTube in IPv6 and the Google browsing in IPv6 and so on. So I will decrease NAT by 50%. And this is not at all negligible. So if I have a network with I have a NAT in IPv4, which is almost, um, I mean, uh, at the limit of its capacity. And you put IPv6 into the network, that same device, which couldn't do any more netting, but now has two or three more years of life without spending anything in terms of CapEx. Robinson, does this answer your question? So, Robinson, did this answer your question? So, let's go on with another presentation with the Q&A. Let's finish asking, answering some of the questions we have over here. In the case of ISPs, it's precisely what you were explaining. It is recommended to use to combine IPv6 to the router, to the client's router, and IPv4 to the internal network of the client. And this has to do with um, installing new equipment. Now, this is Mauricio's question. Now, is it also recommended? 
Well, this depends on the client and also on what the ISP wishes to do. So you can have a provider that puts the router and the Wi-Fi with IPv6. That would be the best solution of all. But of course, this costs money. But of course, maybe you have to take advantage of the change in technology that all networks undergo every four or five years. And at Lechnik, we are well aware of the costs involved in many of these things. But if that ISP is changing its network and the client uh, ISP box broke down or the modem no longer works, this has to be replaced with a CPE that it does IPv4, that does IPv6, and also Wi-Fi in the network. That would be the best scenario. Otherwise, if I'm an ISP and I want to save money, and because I just wish to save money, I just buy a, a poor quality modem that doesn't even offer Wi-Fi. And then the client does not enable IPv6, so we're not doing a very good job. So what I recommend is the following scenario, the one I just mentioned before that, but if I have a client that doesn't have too much technological knowledge and I put a small box, I mean, I mean, your investment will be compensated in a very short period of time, one month, for example. Well, some of the questions could be answered in writing. Guille's comment is interesting. We are an ISP and we're in the process migrating to IPv6, but for the time being, we're taking the initial steps. We're in the midst of the transition. So the percentage of IPv6 adoption is increasing now. In some countries, it is higher compared to others. But there is an increased adoption of IPv6 in many countries. Alejandro is muted. I apologize, he says. Okay. Well, I see here, I had a website over here. Let me find it now. which shows the IPv6 traffic penetration by countries. But in the country, in the planet, more than 40% of the traffic is in IPv6. And all of us who do network operations and manage networks, 40% of all the browsers do so through IPv6. And in Latin America, 30% of all traffic is in IPv6. These are very high numbers. So we really must cater for the needs of these users. Henry is making a comment in the Q&A in Portuguese. And he, this is a comment, and we thank you. He says, he says that you are more vulnerable if you have a global IPv6 address. There's a things that have to change. And let me say that in terms of security, IPv6 was designed to correct that. IPv4 began in, a, in quite a different world in terms of security. If you can look up all the RFCs on IP, and those on IPv4, are about 500, more than 500 RFCs on IPv4 because this evolved over time and started to become adapted in order to figure out solutions. In the case of IPv6, it was far better designed right from the outset. So if you have IPv6, even if you have a global IP address, this is what Henry Godoy says, the security problems are much lesser because these have already been considered even if you have a global IPv6 address. 
And like Alejandro was saying, if you want to have a global IPv6, this is possible. Henry, I thank you for joining us in this webinar. It's an honor to have you here, Henry Godoy, with all you, of you and Ariel too. Henry won the IPv6 challenge. He is a very active person at LACNIC. So thank you very much for joining us today. Very briefly, I have on my screen some graphs. Yes, Robinson. So let me mention, let me show the penetration by country. This is not by SP. If we have the ISP autonomous system, we have an API which people can use and you see the IPv6 traffic you have. Now, basically what we see here on this table is that Argentina has 15% IPv6 penetration. If I start to explain this, it will take too long, but I feel very proud of this because we have been collecting the daily IPv6 penetration for each of the countries in the region since 2014. And you can see here that on February 23rd, this year, even we might even have it until today. Argentina had 16% IPv6 penetration. So out of 100 people using the internet, 16 out of 116 are using IPv6. I won't stop and show you each country. In the case of Brazil, this is a super country. Henry, look at this. They have had an enormous drive through Enatel which is the Brazilian regulator. And Nick.br has done a wonderful job in Brazil. In Brazil, 44 people out of 100 browse with IPv6. Chile started working intensively on this and are already have quite a good IPv6 penetration and so on. We have many countries over here, Ecuador, Salvador, Let's see Venezuela, who ha which has had a small increase, but here we have Trinidad and Tobago. Uruguay has the highest in the region, which is 55%, driven by the national telephone company, Antel. They have a monopoly in that country. And here we have Venezuela, 1.28%. Venezuelans out of 100 use IPv6, and the average for Latin America is 31% of people using IPv6. And if we manage content in IPv6 in the web, we really have to look at these graphs, which are quite relevant. And one point, Alejandro, the fact that the IP, ISPs and IPv6 I'm sorry, the audio is not good again. I'm sorry. So the idea is to have all clients migrating over to IPv6. So native IPv6 devices have to be sold so people can install these devices in their homes without the need to doing any changes. So the mobile phones, the laptops, and all the other devices will automatically connect with the IPv6 router, which costs 10, 20, 30 dollars, not more. And insofar as the market and the users start to become integrated, we'll then see a more relevant growth. So this also has to do with the hardware penetration in the market and the adoption of IPv6. Yes, exactly. So we're running out of time. I just wanted to show you now. And we're going to leave our email addresses in the chat so people can write to us. So this slide over here is we can also share with you. Now, 
This is about ICMPv6 packet filtering. Now, this is not mandatory. We're speaking about security. A neat network is administered as they wish. Now, this slide shows what we might wish to allow. For example, packets too big is one of the options and not so commonly permitted. For example, home agent address discovery request and home agent address discovery reply, mobile prefix solicitation, mobile prefix advertisement. So this is about firewalling. And this is quite well documented. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are quite a number of people out there in the world who have done major deployments with millions and millions of users with IPv6. And we see that the majority have shared their experience with us. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So this would be all on one on my side, Robinson, Sandra. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, answering the questions would take quite a long time. And many of the questions have to do with adoption. So, uh, Robinson and Ale, maybe we can include your email addresses in the chat. Yes, we won't have time to answer the questions, but in general terms, the slides will be available in the website. So thank you very much, Ali. Thank you very much, Robinson. It has been a pleasure to have you today with you. This was an excellent presentation. I'd like to thank all those of you who joined this webinar. We had more than 160 attendees. I hope you enjoyed the session. I hope you learned a lot on this topic. And if you have more topics that you wish to expand on, we have many online courses on IPv6 in LACNIC campus platform. So you can access lacnic.campus.net and see all the available courses we offer. So. In the chat of this session, you have the email addresses of our panelists so that they can answer the questions. This webinar has been recorded and will also be made available to all through a link as well as the slides. So thank you very much once again until the next webinar. Thank you.